Hello, everybody. We are here today to discuss pediatric upper extremity trauma, focusing from the shoulder down to the elbow, and we're going to focus on x-rays. Now, in this time where we want to talk about using appropriate terminology, familiarizing ourselves with the normal anatomy and variants of the upper extremity, developing an approach to x-ray interpretation, as well as familiarizing ourselves with common injuries. So in terms of terminology, we always want to talk about type of the fracture. Can we describe this fracture to another person? Is it complete? Does it go all the way through the bone? Or is it incomplete? Is there bowing or buckling? Or is there a green stick fracture? Also importantly in pediatrics, we want to highlight Salter-Harris fractures. And that's going to be the involvement of the growth plate. And then lastly, as an adult and in pediatrics, do these fractures involve the joint and are they intraarticular? So in pediatrics, we specify where is the fracture? Does it involve the diaphysis or the shaft? Does it involve the metaphysis or the epiphysis? Now this is going to come into play as we discuss Salter-Harris classifications, right? So we want to talk about fractures through the growth plate and how it involves the rest of the bone. Type 1 is going to just be a fracture through the growth plate. Type 2 Salter-Harris fracture is through the growth plate and into the metaphysis. Type 3 is where the fracture extends from the metaphysis and goes into the epiphysis. Type 4 is involving both the metaphysis and the epiphysis. And type 5 is a crush injury where we have actual loss of the growth plate. Now in terms of terminology and describing actual alignment, we can talk about both angulation and translation. And we always want to refer back to the longitudinal axis of whichever bone we're talking about, but we can have angulation as we see in the middle finger, and we can also have translation or displacement. Um, and again, how are the fracture fragments moving relative to the natural longitudinal axis? Now with angulation and translation, you can have a combination of all of those. You can have a distraction, you can have lateral displacement with angulation, without angulation, uh, you can have foreshortening and overlap. So there's a combination of all of these things which we want to use the terms provided above so that we can describe it to our colleagues, including our orthopedists. So we're going to go down to the shoulder. Now I want to highlight two views that might be a little confusing. The first is the axillary view, which gives us a good view of the glenohumeral joint, but also highlighted in red is the acromion. And we always, this view always gives us a good look at the acromion. And then the other view is the transcapular view, which we see a lot of overlap of different structures. Um, and highlighted in red is the glenoid fossa. And when we're looking for location and dislocation, how does the humeral head relate to that glenoid fossa? So let's move on. Let's talk about some normal variants. We have our growth plate of the proximal humerus. And you can see in our yellow and blue arrows, because this is a three-dimensional structure, the x-ray beam might actually intersect the growth plate in two positions. And you'll see this normal view of the growth plate. Now, we do not want to distinguish that or mistake that for a proximal humeral fracture where the growth plate is normal, but then you also have separately is a fracture where you have cortical discontinuity, and that is separate from the growth plate. One of our more common injuries in both pediatrics and adult is anterior dislocation, and you can see that on both these frontal views and the transcapular view. Now, a little harder to diagnose is going to be your posterior dislocation. Now on the front of you, what we're seeing is internal rotation and we get what's called the trough sign, where you have vertically oriented linear sclerosis, um, kind of paralleling the anterior cortex, and that's from an impaction injury. But on this view on the left, the frontal view, you might not pick up the actual dislocation, whereas on our axillary view, we can see that there's an impacted humeral head which is actually engaged along the glenoid posteriorly. 
what is our abnormality here? This is going to be one of our complications of dislocations, particularly anterior dislocation. And we can see the, the arrow is pointed to a subtle bank heart lesion. I wanted to move on and start talking about acromioclavicular joint separation. This is also a common injury in adults. And here we can see that there's elevation of the distal clavicle relative to the acromion. However, I want to highlight the fact that in pediatrics, you might have apparent widening of the AC joint, and that's because our bones in pediatrics haven't fully ossified. We don't want to mistake that for AC separation. And this slide is showing really what's going on. We have our ossification centers of the distal clavicle and distal acromion on MRI on the right, and we can see that they take up the space on the x-ray on the left, which otherwise we would mistake for widening of the joint. Few other normal variants are these secondary ossification centers that we readily see in adolescents on the distal acromion. Now, we might misinterpret these for avulsion fractures, but the MRI shows us clearly that this is part of the acromion and is just a normal ossification center. We actually could get a bunch of them, a few of them where you get this lobulated appearance as the arrows are showing on the MRI of the distal acromion. Again, this is normal developmental variant. What is our abnormality over here on this chest x-ray? What we're seeing is a difference in the level of the clavicles, and we can see that they are uneven, and this is sternoclavicular joint dislocation. Now, we can get a better analysis if we have availability of getting a CT with contrast, I prefer doing the CT with contrast so we can evaluate the great vessels and make sure that there's no compression of one of those vessels, which would be helpful for our orthopedic colleagues if they're going to go operate. What is our abnormality here that we're seeing in the proximal humerus? Well, we have a fracture, but then there's also a lytic or a mixed density lesion within the proximal humerus. This is actually a unocameral bone cyst, a fairly common appearance and location for bone cysts which have propensity to fracture. Here is another fairly common injury in pediatrics. This is little league shoulder. And we can see that we have some asymmetrical widening of the proximal humerus laterally um, and that we're seeing a bit of sclerosis along the physis, and we can see on the MRI as well that widening of the growth plate as well as some bone marrow edema as well in the proximal metaphysis. Okay, next we're going to move down to the elbow, and in the elbow, one of our most important things to always be thinking about is elbow alignment in terms of the radial capitellar line, which the radial head should always be articulating with the capitellum no matter what position the elbow is in, flexion, extension, rotation, whatever's going on, the radius should always articulate with the capitellum. And the anterior humeral line, which is a line drawn along the anterior cortex of the humerus, and that should intersect with the middle third of the capitellum, as we can see on the image on the right. So here we have a bunch of images that we can see the radio capitellar alignment, and we should always be able to draw a line through. If we're unable to draw a line through the radius and the capitellum, then we're worried about an element of dislocation. Now along the same lines, we always want to look at our elbow ossification centers, and we have a mnemonic for this, for the which is we call crito, which the ossification centers as above appear at 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11 years, starting with the capitellum and ending with the external epicondyle. So another important factor in evaluating elbow radiographs is looking for joint effusions. And these diagrams are kind of giving us an idea of what's actually happening in our top images, we can see as the 
elbow is extending and we end up with a supracondylar fracture. Down in the images below, we're seeing blood developing in the joint space, and that's pushing up those fat pads, which are yellow anteriorly and posteriorly, and on the corresponding images actually appear kind of black, and that's what we're going to see on our x-rays. And this is further examples of that. So you have your anterior and posterior fat pads that get elevated because of a joint effusion, whether it's filled with water or with blood. So we have various different fractures, a lot of them related to the ossification centers that we described above. And so we're going to start off, what type of fracture is this? So here we're seeing a elbow joint effusion. We also have cortical discontinuity of the distal humerus. It's not involving the ossification centers. It's above it. This is a supracondylar fracture. But our question is, what type of supracondylar fracture is this? And does it matter? So we actually have grading of supracondylar fractures, 1, 2, and 3. And that's going to depend upon the displacement of the distal humerus and the more proximal humerus. And in type 1, there is no displacement. In type 2, only the anterior wall is displaced and the posterior hinge is maintained. And in type 3, you have complete displacement both anteriorly and posteriorly. And this is going to appear as such on the x-rays where our anterior humeral line comes into place. In type 1, you should have a maintained anterior humeral line, whereas in a type 2 supracondylar fracture, you do not have maintenance of that anterior humeral line. In type 3, everything is disrupted. So what is our abnormality on this x-ray? It's also maybe a little subtle, but we see that there's a lateral condylar fracture. Here are zoomed up views of another lateral condylar fracture that we can see. This is going to be a more extreme version of the lateral condylar fracture where you actually get displacement of the condyle itself as well as rotation. What's our abnormality over here? So now we're on the other side of the elbow and this is a medial epicondyle avulsion fracture. And what we have over here this in this diagram, we're seeing our common tendons that insert onto the medial epicondyle um, when they when there's too much of a force, they can have a avulsion fracture pulling off that medial epicondyle ossification center. What do we think is going on over here? So we can see from the beginning that there are soft tissue swelling. There's probably elevation of the anterior fat pad. Is anything else going on? Not sure. This red arrow points to a small ossification center that is kind of overlapped on both views by other bones by the olecranon. And this, in fact, is a medial epicondyle avulsion fracture. And when we're looking at this ossification center, we always want to think back about crito and think what should be our ossification centers that are present, where is this ossification center arising from? So if we think about, we see the capitellum, that's C, the radius is for R, and then we're seeing the next one is the internal or the medial epicondyle, so that should be the next ossification center that we see, and this is an avulsion fracture where it gets displaced um, antero-inferiorly, and we're kind of getting, we might misinterpret it and not see that there's overlap from the olecranon. In our older children, we, and our athletes, we might see medial epicondyl apophysitis. And so here we're going to get widening of the medial epicondylar physis. And you have some adjacent sclerosis and cortical irregularity. Compare that to the image on the right in the asymptomatic side of the same patient, which is normal. Now, we also have our radial fractures. We have a few different types of radial fractures, and some are going to be more subtle than the others, such as this one over here. All we're seeing on this radial neck fracture is slight angulation. 
this next elbow x-ray what's our abnormality we do see a joint diffusion but we don't know what we don't see any fracture on this view necessarily but then when we have a slight different angulation on this different view we can see this non-displaced radial head fracture so we always want to be aware especially if we don't see a fracture at least understand that there's a joint diffusion which has a high likelihood of indicating an occult or radiographically occult non-displaced fracture. All right, what's going on over here? This is a very young patient, an infant. We don't see any ossification centers. Everything seems kind of bunched up. We draw our anterior humeral line and we see that even though there's no cavitellum, there would not be room for our capitellar ossification center or a radial head ossification center, so something must be going on. And we can see on the orthogram, we can now actually see the outline of the non ossified radial head ossification center and the capitellar ossification center, and that there's actually an injury, which is known as distal humeral physeal or epiphyseal separation, like a Salter Harris 1 fracture that occurs in newborns or in very young infants. What's our abnormality over here? We have our lateral view and our frontal view of the elbow and we can see here we have an osteochondral lesion. Um, sometimes might have been more subtle on the lateral but we see it pretty well on the frontal and we know that we can grade these osteochondral lesions differently. Um, according to different systems. And we're going to end with one more abnormality. What do we see here? Even though it's a form x-ray, we still want to make sure that we have radio capitellar alignment, and this is radial head dislocation. So in summary, we've discussed our terminology, we're normal anatomy we've discussed, an approach to x-ray interpretation, and some common injuries that we encounter in the pediatric patients. And this is below a list of references. Thank you very much.